Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome. It's another episode of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. And on today's show, I'm joined by Grandmaster Rudy Duncan. This one's a little while in the making, and I'm glad that we're making it happen. <laughs> For those of you out there, if you're new, if you've never checked out what we do, please check out whistlekick.com because we do a lot of different things and we do them all in support of you, the traditional martial artists of the world. So whether it's this show or the events that we do or the products and services, training programs that we make, please go check them out. And of course, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com is the place to go for everything related to the show. All 900 and whatever episodes we've done are available there to you. So Rudy, thanks for being here. I, I As I, I, I was getting ready, I, I had this, this voice in my head saying, maybe we need to give him like a professional wrestling style interview. You know, like, Rudy, right? You know, some, something... Something like that. I, th I thought that would be fun, but that's not really my style personally, so I abandoned it. No, the, it, the introduction <laughs> was good. Well, thank you. How are you? How's it going? I'm good. I'm good. It's yeah. today's my birthday. I want you to know. Is it really? Yeah. Happy birthday. Yeah. Thank you. And you're spending some of it with me. I am Absolutely. flattered. I'm honored. I mean, we've, we've been trying for years to have. We we have birthday. talked about this for a little while. Yeah, but. As I've, I've said to many people many times, you know, sometimes the timing isn't up to us, right? Sometimes that timing comes from other places, other people, and the episodes that get, I don't want to say delayed, but they don't happen, you know, when we first start talking about them, somehow they still end up being great episodes and maybe they're better because we waited. Absolutely. Life I don't, I don't, I don't gets know. in the way sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. And you're speaking of life. I don't want to say getting in the way because that suggests maybe it's things you don't want to do. But I know you are a very busy man, but everything that I hear you talk about, you have this huge smile on your face. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I, I'm a very positive person. And I think that the martial arts has been just a, a great journey for me. I've hmm. met people for the past 60 years all over the world. So for me, uh, it's having an extended family, which I love. Yeah. How'd you get started? Well, it, interesting. I started 1961 as a young kid. Which seems crazy because you're 30. I don't know, yeah, how, yeah. I don't know how that math works. Double but, 30s, right. yes. yes. <laughs> uh, I, um, I actually didn't know anything about karate. I was visiting a relative next to a church and i saw a couple people in what i thought were white pajamas in the backyard doing crazy things so i said to my uncle what are those guys doing in pajamas and he said they're doing karate i didn't know what karate was and then he explained that they that's what it was they were doing martial arts so i jumped over the fence and started copying what the guys were doing well, the guy was a professor from Korea studying at Syracuse University, and he had a small class of about seven people. And he didn't speak much English, but he yelled at me all the time when I jumped over the fence and was copying the guys. Well, eight years later, I got my black belt with him, and that was my first introduction into martial arts. You know, and that is probably the best short and still accurate description of martial arts, people jumping around doing crazy things in pajamas. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, well, it's fairly accurate. You might not wear the pajamas, but you're still jumping around and doing crazy things, regardless of what style you're training. I, I like that. Well, I always tell my students, martial arts should look like a bad accident or silk. <laughs> <laughs> it's a pity I look before. <laughs> Oh, I, I think much more of, of what I do looks <laughs> looks like a bad accident. But, you know, if it, I guess if it gets the job done, right? Absolutely. H how old were you when you jumped over the fence the first time? I, I was in seventh grade. I was 13. Okay. So 13. Since, since, and since that time, yeah. You know, you're training. Were you, because you, you said the gentleman was from Korea, but you were training karate. Yeah, he, which he, which he might hit some people's brains funny because I think some people assume, well, if you're from Korea, you have to do Taekwondo. Yeah, right. Well, it, it was a style of twa Taekwondo back then. Okay. So I did that till I was, oh, 18. 
And then I started in uh, Okinawa Goju. Okay. And my both my instructors were Marines mm. who had studied and lived in Okinawa for years. And so yeah. they learned from two of the three of the schools in Okinawa. Uh, one was uh, Mabukan School, Miyagi School, and yeah. the other one was a uh, Shobukan School. Um, and that is such a common story. I, I think such, I don't know if how many people alive in training today realize how many of us that train are one to two generations from a Marine that was stationed in Okinawa. Absolutely. Huge yeah. numbers. Well, people have to remember until the late sixties, we had boxing. We didn't have martial arts. Martial arts didn't get to us until the late sixties or so. Everybody did boxing in different places around the world, but Martial we had some art. judo, if you knew yeah, where to look. Judo and and even at Kido, you saw that in, in, in Japan and stuff. But until the late 60s, especially on the East Coast, mm. when I started at Goju, that was the only the first school open up in Syracuse. Mm. And that was like 1960-something. I didn't start. And that's still pretty early. Now, Syracuse is a... Uh... You know, not a huge city, but it, it's a good size, especially, you know, if you get north of that latitude, you know, to those of you who don't know your, your northeast geography, it's a good sized town for for getting that far north. But to have one school, I mean, how, how many schools does the Syracuse area have now? Oh, we probably have 60 schools. Yeah, it's the, the, it's changed so much. And here you you were fortunate enough to be right next to something that was happening that sparked your interest at that moment yeah and 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 so you know both my instructors were marines and uh, mm -hmm. the kids class they didn't have a kids class they only had adults because they didn't want to teach kids <laughs> so very few I, people were teaching kids back then oh yeah so and it's probably good they didn't teach kids because it was it was brutal training you know, we trained like we were into the military. We trained seven days a week, four wow. to five hours of class. Really? Yeah. That's a commitment. That's a job. It, it was. It was. And we didn't know that because that was the only way that we knew to train. Yeah. So we didn't know that there was other methods of training at that well, time given that it was so much time what else were you doing with your day were you working were you going to school uh yeah um i had graduated so um i started my junior and senior year in goju mm -hmm. and then i graduated and went down to Uni university hampton university of virginia mm -hmm. and while i was there i studied judo <laughs> and then in the summers i would come back and continue to go Jew with my instructors. So I did that till 1979, mm -hmm. and then I got into the Kimple system. Okay. And that was and, by accident. Oh, okay. I, I was gonna ask because, you know, if, one of the things I find interesting is you we, we get people on the show, and I guess it really could only happen one of two ways, but I find both paths, paths interesting. You know, somebody starts training in you know, a particular style of something, and then they can't find that. So they find what's the closest thing and they end up in these very similar styles. And then you get people, whether by choice or by circumstance, they start training in, I don't know, Chinese goju. And then they, they wake up one day and say, uh, I'm, I'm going to do, I don't know, what's, what's the exact opposite of that? Um, maybe Kyokushin. Yeah, yeah. Right? So, oh, something, I, I, you know, something a little softer to something a, a lot right. less soft, you know, and I can see the transition. I can see, you know, I've spent enough time um, with, with some people who've done Chinese goju or Okinawan goju, and, and there's some similar philosophy to Kempo. Yeah. Well, so how'd that happen? Well, if you remember, the all the martial arts came out of a Okinawa came from the Shirinru temple, mm -hmm. from the monks. They practice a system of training which we call Xuan Fao, which meant mm -hmm. Chinese hand or Chinese fist. 
So when the Okinawans learned it, they didn't have a name for it. Mm. So when the emperor in Japan heard that they were practicing this stuff, he sent an embassy over and they had to have a name for it. They didn't mm. want to call it Chuan Fao, Chinese fist or Chinese hand. So they called it Te. Right. And then later they called it Naha Te because that was the city that was closest to it. Mm. And then only when it went back to Japan, then they called it Karate. Because you couldn't, you. <laughs> not everyone realizes there's some, there's been still some tension between mainland Japan and Okinawa. Yes. yes. So, so anyhow, the Kempo was the, the word, American word for Xuan Fao, Chinese hand or Chinese fist. Okay. See, I didn't, I didn't know that. Okay. So we're, we're talking about Kempo being kind of throwing it back, going, yes. going a little more historical to yeah. that. Okay, and interesting. People don't know that, so I, I didn't know people, that. If you do more of the hard kempo, they you do K E N P O. If you put the M in, you mean you're doing more of the soft Chinese kempo. Okay. Now, so a question, because I know mean. some people get really, really, <laughs> really wrapped around the axle on that one. Is that something that we've come to do in the States or is that supported, you know, back through translation? Is that, is, is that how it was also done then? Or is that just we've, what we've started to no, do? No, now? no, no, no. You know, systems are man-made. Okay. All right. That, that's what I thought, but I, I wanted to find the nice way to ask because somebody yeah. out there is going, see, well, you know what? No, no. So people, people, Whoever they train with, if it was more hard style or whatever, and they see that a lot of it came from a more Japanese-based system, then they they, they use the N, K-N-P-O. If people think like the Fred Valari system with Fred Kahn, you know, the five animals, and Fred called it Shaolin Kempo, then people say, oh, that's a more soft system. So then they started using the K-N-P-O part of it does it make a difference not really you know to, to some people <laughs> i i've had people get really bent out of shape and correct my spelling and i, I said okay you you realize you're arguing about the translation of a thing where these letters don't exist right no no and it's a philosophy <laughs> so it's mainly it's mainly philosophy like Jing make, that makes sense that, that bruce lee did is a philosophy it's not a system Wing sure. Chun is a system. Jin Kung Do is a philosophy. Okay. So it depends on what your philosophy is, <laughs> which designation you use. Yeah. So, so how did you find? And and I'm having a really hard time not making a joke here. <laughs> Tempo. <laughs> I well, it, it, I did the hard styles, and then I was traveling one day in Syracuse, and I saw a sign. That says Kempo. And I said, Oh, I didn't know there was anything Kempo in Circus. So I went in. You'd heard about it at some point yeah, through your travels. Yeah. And I went in, and the guy had carpet. <laughs> and we trained on concrete floors and pillars in the middle. And, <laughs> and people were laughing and having a good time. And I was like, Oh my God, you can do this in karate? Never heard of such a thing. <laughs> so I, I went in. And there was a nice guy, Doug Savage, nice young kid, and he was teaching the prevalari system of uh, Kimpo. So I introduced myself and said, hey, can I come in and try out sometime? And he said, yeah. And that was my first experience of getting into the prevalari system, mm -hmm. late 1970s and, and stuff. Which I... I you know, I'm, I'm from the Northeast, right? You know, I grew up in Maine. Yes. I've only ever lived in New England. But there was a time that I remember through the 80s. I, I you know, I was born in 79, started training in the early 80s. And I remember the mid, the late 80s, there was a Valari school in every town. Oh, yes. yes. Every town. Yes. And, and people think, Jeremy, you're exaggerating. I'm really not. They, they, little towns of you know five, six, eight thousand people. Yeah. The organization found a way. Who can we get to run a school here? And 
it made an, an, an impact and, and we could have discussions over the what the res, what that impact was, but I, I'm going to stay off that. <laughs> but I know enough about not just the system, but the organization to know that that's a dramatic departure from a full-time job's worth of training. Absolutely. Well, it was, Trevor Lowry was one of the first ones that marketed karate in a certain way. Before then, it was little schools and, and you know, people taught at community centers, but people didn't really have franchises. That He was one of the first ones that developed the whole concept of franchises, uh, of developing a system that you could, you know, train people in and then set them off to teach and open up schools. And, yeah. and that's, that's good or bad. Um, depending on how you look at it. I enjoyed my time with the Fred Bellari system, but unfortunately, like big organizations, they tend to have a lot of politics in it, and eventually things start to fall apart, which, mm -hmm. which uh, you know, I was sad to see because Fred Bellari, when I open up and I open up under Fred Bellari system, I was the first one to open up a satellite school where I didn't have to do a franchise fee. How'd you get that deal? Well, Fred allowed me to do that. So I always had a special. So that, that suggests to me, Fred. because, you know, I'll, I'll be honest. Um, when, when he passed, I was really sad. I'd never gotten to speak with him because. And, and I, I think longtime audience members know I, I don't I don't play the political game. I don't I don't do any of that. I don't judge anybody. If you're reaching martial artists, you know, you're, you're, you're good in, in my book. Absolutely. And, and he did that. He reached more martial artists and he did more for martial arts than just about anybody. And I really wanted to talk to him. And so it didn't happen. He's gone. Yeah. He put, but he put you had it. You obviously knew him man. better than most. If yeah, he, yeah. So can, can you speak? I talked to him over the years and, and stuff. In fact, I got invited for his 50th. You know, and, and conflicts in my life, I couldn't make it. But sure. I was glad that he invited me mm. uh, to that and stuff. So, yeah, it was sad that he passed away. But, yeah, he helped put martial arts on the East Coast on the market. In fact, Grandmaster Gaskin, one of my uh, people that I teach his system, he always wanted to meet Fred Bellardi. Mm. And he was sad that he never got a chance to meet Fred because he thought he had a major impact on the martial arts sure. community, which he did. And anytime I see a man who is that big of a figure publicly, yeah. it tells me there's probably something that they're covering or hiding, that they're probably a different person quietly with the people they know well one-on-one. -on -one. Was that, was that the case with him? Did you know him well enough that you would no, say that to be I true? No, people, I know other people that knew him well enough. And okay. yeah, he had, he had another side, like most of us. You know, yeah. when we're in the limelight, he's shown bright. Right. But with family members and everything else, yeah, he was just, just a regular guy. Yeah. Okay. What was it about your, your Kempo time that made you embrace that system versus these other things that you had done? Well, you know, the, the other styles really put a lot of emphasis on cotton, mm -hmm. um, but not a lot of emphasis on fighting and self-defense. Mm -hmm. They did fighting in terms of tournament fighting and whatever, but Kempo for me was an art that had a lot of good self-defense aspects to it. Um, was that something that was important to you early on and you hadn't um, found it? Or was it the contrast that made you say? It was a this. contrast. I had studied and got very good at katas and performing and stuff like that. Um, but then when I went to the Kimple system and I saw that they did other kind of things, uh, a lot of more hands and foot kind of combinations and stuff, I really thought that that was uh, a good system. Um, that took me to another level. And 
because I did that, then I also went into the Indonesian Filipino martial arts, mm. a Silat and whatever. And Kempo was a great entry into that because whatever we did with the open hands, we also did with sticks or knives. So that trans transition helped me um, continue my career in other ways. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm so used to so many people describing their system now as Kempo or Kempo Jiu Jitsu or Kempo Jiu Jitsu Eskrima, right? Like they, they tack on these other things that philosophically kind of round out the, the art that they practice. And I only see that in, in the Kempo world. And I'm intentionally, for those of you listening or, or even watching, if you watch my lips, I'm trying to smush the M and the N together. I'm trying to make a new sound so I don't offend anyone. Yeah. But well, Kimbo, Kimbo I find that fascinating from a lot of different systems. Yeah. So, you know, we we acknowledge that our forms came from, you know, Shotokan, the Heons. Our Penyons were Heons that we changed. <laughs> so, you know, um, and we were the first bad boys in the martial arts because we wore blacks to tournament. <laughs> And in the old days, we couldn't do tournaments. They threw us out because the really people wear white uniforms. We weren't allowed to do the tournament. So we were the first bad boys of tournaments. The original Cobra Kai. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Not that bad, but, you know. <laughs> but uh, so, you know, there's a lot of nice things about, uh, about Kempo. You know, um, I also did a little American Kempo because Ed Parker's system had Al Tracy and a bunch of guys here in Syracuse develop the Ed Parker system of uh, Valarius martial arts which became real big here in, in Syracuse. And he and that was the Ed Parker system. So I had a lot of friends that did American Kimball while I was doing the Fred Valarius Shaolin Kimball. Um, so that was a nice thing. I got to mix with so many martial artists, even in Syracuse, mm. that we cross trained. And the nice thing about once you cross train, then you are a martial arts community. It's not like my style is better than your style, which is right. no such thing. Right. But what, what's interesting, you know, I'm fortunate in that I've had the chance to talk to a lot of people over, you know, who've trained over the decades and started training at various times. And there seems to be, seems to have been this kind of peak of my school is better than yours. Don't, don't train with anybody else. And that seems to have gone from about 75 to 95. That seems like that was in the, kind of the peak there. But what you're talking about is you had the, you didn't have that experience. And that's really interesting. No, no. And also, I mean, I've spent the last 30, 40 years inviting different martial artists from different systems mm. into my dojo to teach ongoing. Mm. So people come from Canada, people come from everywhere. I invite them to come and teach. And so we have that martial community all as one. Um, and unless you do that, you get, you know, you get that certain ego and pride in your own school. And therefore, you start to develop that attitude like this system is better than other systems mm -hmm. because you don't branch out and you don't look at other systems and stuff. Mm -hmm. But by inviting other people in and sharing information, then you lose that kind of uh, egocentricity. And that was something that I, I think struck me because I heard about you long before we met. But that was the thing that I that I heard that people told me about you. And then when I met you, I don't get any sense of ego from you. Maybe you hide it really well, but that's just that, <laughs> well, that's never that's been. Important. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing is, uh, I remember when I met Grandmaster Gaskin, Victor Sunday Gaskin. And I was teaching the Karazimpa Goshen Jitsu system. And we were doing some forms and katas. And he said, oh, you're doing them different than I taught. And I said, oh, should we go back and learn them the way you did? He goes, no. He says, you've been teaching longer, the system longer than I ever did. And I started laughing. He said, also, art is a living art, martial arts. It has to grow and has to develop. I taught a system 30, 40 years ago. He said, I expect you to take it to the next level. 
you know, tradition means something came before you, but it doesn't mean that you always have to do things the same way. I want to take that sound bite and I want to clip it out. And I, I want to, I want to hardwire into headphones and duct tape those headphones <laughs> to about half the martial arts community. Because I agree with you, yeah. right? You can't, if something doesn't change, it can't get better. No. And why wouldn't we want it to get better? Yeah. Well, I don't have an answer to that. Well, because I always you know, want everything to get better. Yeah. But see, that was the mindset. Yeah. You know. You have to remember a lot of the cultures, a lot of the stuff that we practice came from Oriental culture, mm -hmm. Japanese, very rigid, very set culture and stuff. So sure. to say that you're going to change stuff that came before you is like, oh, my God, you know, you can't you can't do that. But just like warfare, we don't mm -hmm. fight the same way we did 150 years ago. Everything changes in life. We have to change with it. So I think since martial arts has only been around for 50 something or so years, because like from the late 1950s to now, we're starting to understand that it's okay to take it to another level. Yeah. You know, and don't get locked into the past. Right. And, and one of the things I think is, is really interesting is if we consider the last 10 to 15 years, the, the tremendous usage of the internet to spread what we're doing, to talk about what we're doing, sharing ideas, critiquing ideas. If we were to find some way to chart the growth of martial arts, I don't mean by participation, but right. I mean right. in skill effectiveness, et cetera, it, it's, it's made a huge swing upwards because now we can compare all these ideas really quickly. You don't have to know the person holding the seminar and get up and drive three hours to go to it. You can watch a YouTube video and that might give you an idea. And I love that. And it wow. seems like you're embracing that philosophy as well. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm also part of an international group and that group has, you know, people all over the world. So the nice thing about that is you can talk to different people in Europe, in, in South Africa, in India. Um, and because of that, it opens up a whole new avenue for you. So the Internet is important. The only bad thing about it is some people then go to the Internet to learn and think, therefore, they're training. And when I tell people, no, mm -hmm. you train. Then you can go to the internet and look at different stuff, but you have to train first to get proper yeah. application and movement. Yeah. I, I see I see books, video, et cetera, as an opportunity to refine yes. or to adjust, right? It's it's detail, it's not macro, it's not the big stuff. No, no. Those are tools. You know, yeah. tools to aid aid you in your development, but you, you need the personalized training. So here we are, we're, we're, we're stacking systems. You've got all these systems that, that you've trained in. How much of the, the early stuff that you did can we find? Are there, are there bits in what you do and train and teach now? Yeah, yeah. I it's mean, the old, the, the old katas and, and, and stuff from Goju are, mm. are, are still there. Um, People always argue what's the benefit of katas. Katas, uh, you can look at a couple of ways. Katas teach you movement. It, it's prearranged fights to give you something to think about. But it teaches you proper stances, distancing, spatial distancing, uh, turning left, right, both sides and stuff. So there's a lot of be benefit to kata. But you have to understand, kata is not fighting. No. You're not going to fight like that in a street fight. So you have to change the kata. And if you just stick with how you learn something without examining it, then you won't develop. So I take what I've learned the old day and I, ma I made it better. Mm. And that's, we talk about the bunkai when people say bunkai. Bunkai is the hidden meaning behind what you do. 
-hmm. But I tell people bunkai is a discussion. There's no right answer. It's just a discussion. Because you may view it, Jeremy may view it different from I may view it. Both points are good. I can't say one's better than the other. So if you tell people it's a discussion, then you move forward a lot more. I think the value is less in what is the meaning and more so in looking for the meaning, the discussion over the meaning. I think that is much more valuable. Oh, oh, it could be this. But what about the massive thought process you went through to come up with? It could be this, or it's not that, or what if it was this, right? Like, I think that is much more interesting. And, and this came to me while you were talking. Kata was kind of the old YouTube. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. It, if all you do is kata, you're, you're going to be missing some things. Well, but if you've got it. other things and you go back to them, there's a lot you can pull out. Well, you know, you, you go in the seminars, you know that sure. you, you go to a seminar and then you stop and say, anybody has any questions? And there's hardly one question in the room. <laughs> and you just said, well, hold it. I just went through a whole bunch of stuff. Nobody has any questions. And that's because we don't do that in regular class. Right. You have to do that in regular class to train people to ask why. And, and why does this happen? And why are we doing this? And could it be different? And what about this? And if they don't feel okay to do that in class, they sure as hell not going to do it in a seminar. Right. Right. So it, I, we have, at the end of every class, we have a discussion, even in the kids' class. Yeah, good. What did you do today? What did you learn? How did you feel? Uh, what worked? What didn't work? What do you think about this stuff? And for kids, we want that creativity. We want them to learn to think, not just do stuff. But I, I don't know how this happened. This happened organically when I started my school. My school isn't even quite a year old. But we end, and I invite the students, who has a great question. And it's led to some wonderful conversation. Yeah. But it's also changed the tone of classes. I've had students... And I'm thinking it's one example. Um, you know, I teach my students, even in early rank, brush grab strike. And one of them is like, this seems awfully inefficient. It's three things. Why can't I just block strike? And so we had a good conversation about it. And as he got better, he went, I get it now, right? And I think that that's so important. I, I think learning... You, you gotta, you gotta kind of memorize. You kind of gotta trust. You kind of gotta go through the motions. It's, but at some point, you gotta start asking why. You gotta understand. Well, yeah. And in the old days, when you did classes, you didn't get to talk. Mm -hmm. It was all very structured in training. Yeah. So that stayed with people for a long period of time. You didn't ask questions in class. You know, if the instructor asked you a question, you could respond, but you couldn't raise your hand and say, oh, what about this? What about that? I, I did a lot of push-ups. Yeah, yeah. So a lot of push-ups because of why. That mentality. One of the yeah. things that I passed on to, you know, my, my long-term student, Jesse, is that same kind of thing. Question and answer and talk and, and have people, you know, just don't go with what you say, but feel free to ask whatever questions and stuff. Yeah. In seminars, I always ask, what's more important, when or how to move? Mm. And half the people, when? And half the people, how? But nobody says, both are equally important. You know, everybody will pick one, but they don't understand that they're all important and why they're important. Yeah, so different training over the years and, and stuff. The fear is martial arts in traditional ways as we view it are starting to go down a little bit. What do you mean by that? Well, because we have these 30 minute kickboxing fitness centers where people want to come in. They don't want history. They don't want any knowledge. They just want to come and sweat, work mm -hmm. out, hit some bags and stuff. So you have a whole industry that, to that. The next industry you have that's taken over is Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. 
mm-hmm. which is which is which is great, you know. But once again, people are doing techniques. There's no long. There's no history. There's no discussion of the arts. Some I'll, I'll I'll challenge you a little bit there because there are. I, I see I see. BJJ is one of those arts that can be trained in a very modern way, a very non-traditional way, like you're talking about. But I've also known and, and even trained at schools that do take a very traditional approach philosophically. And you, you can tell when you, yeah. when you, when you work with someone right. very quickly with what kind of school they were at. But, you know, we don't have the days where people train seven days a week, four hours a day. And, and do no. Like those days are all, no, we don't. you know, and you can't afford to with life, life interferes with family, college, you know, kids, all that kind of stuff. And that's okay. Us old dinosaurs, myself, you know, we train every day, not because we have classes, but we do that for our own personal development. Because you don't know what else to do. What else would you do with that time? What's more valuable than the time training? Yeah. Well, Painting the house, <laughs> yard work, and there's a lot of other things we do. <laughs> but training is important. Yeah. Now, you mentioned Jesse, who, of course, is Jesse Dwyer, who's been on the show. Great guy. Uh, one of the best senses of humor of, of anybody I know. I don't know how much of that he got from you. You also have a wonderful sense of humor. So we'll, we'll give you all the credit for yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> But you, you, I forget how you put it, but you, the way you expressed it was kind of that he's taking what you've taught him and running with it. It's almost like you've, you've handed some things off. Is that, did I get that right? Is yeah, that... yeah. When, when, when he first opened up, he was like, oh, we should franchise. And I go, we're not franchising. I want you to be your own person, run your own school, put your own thumbprint on it. That's the important thing I want you to learn, that sure. you need to teach the way that you feel is important for you, hmm. because then you'll be successful with your students. Um, we pride ourselves on building relationships. A lot of schools in the old days, uh, you come in, you pay, you do your monthly stuff, whatever, but you didn't. they didn't really get to know you, you didn't really get to know them. I've always had a family type relationship with my students and I think that's carried on through Jesse mm. and we always say when you get your black belt now welcome to the family you're part of the extended family and stuff so I'm proud that he's 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 done that but also I wanted him to to be his own person you know, sometimes people try to copy your instructor and the way that they do things. And it doesn't always work out because we're, we're not the same people. You have to do it your way. So I've given them a lot of credit and um, rope to say, go out and do it your way. And then when he does things that I think need a little <laughs> taken back, then I pick up the phone and I call him. Uh, well, maybe you don't want to do that. But... <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think it's so refreshing because so many of us, and, and right, and this kind of comes back comes back to ego because I think a lot of people, you know, you've you've touched on your age a couple times. Folks even much younger than you start to think about their legacy, yeah. And to a lot of them, that legacy is. This is the style. These are the forms. This is how we're doing them. I'm going to put it on, I'm going to, you know, in the old days, tape. I'm going to record them. We're going to keep this exactly as it is. I'm going to write a book, whatever it is. And that, I think, is a trap. Because as you said, nobody else is ever going to be you. At, at best, they are 99% you. Right? Well, that means it gets less. It gets worse over time. And I don't think that's a good thing. I don't think anybody thinks that's a good thing, assuming they, they agree with my math. Well, you know, the other day I was looking at all these plaques and awards and all this kind of stuff, and I said, what am I going to do with this? You know, when I when I pass, who's going to want this stuff? I, I feel good that I've had all these accolades from martial arts hall of fame, from, from instructors and different stuff, people that, you know, value what I... I've taught them or whatever, but 
it's going to go someplace. But you know, I told Jesse I box up a lot of it to send to him, and then he can do stuff with it. Because my son and daughter don't want that stuff. They got their own stuff. Um, I wrote an article one time called In Search of Our Fathers. Mm-hmm. And it's on my website. But somebody asked me, you know, it's like, oh, you know, what about rank? And what about this? And what about all these accolades? And I go, that's not important. I said, the most, the best accolades I ever got in my life is that parents trust me enough to send their kids to train with me. What more can you get? Yeah. That's the best pat on the back I can ever get. I have, you know, there there are plaques and certificates and things in the other room there. And I, if the place was burning, I'm not going to save those. I'm going to save the thank you card from the student that earned her yellow belt before she took off, right? Like that heartfelt note that I, I helped change someone's life. Oh, yeah. Right? That means more to me than proof of what I've done. I know what I've done. I don't care if anybody else knows what I've right, done. Right. But well, I'm hearing you say similar. Yeah. Well, that's why I think I've been successful um, in getting along with so many different martial artists from all over. Mm. Because one, never cared about rank, never interested in it, just care about knowledge and sharing knowledge. So when right. people meet me, that's what we talk about. You know? knowledge and learning because I can always learn. I tell my students, I learn from them every time I teach class, whether it's a white belt or whatever. I become a better teacher. White belts are really, really good at teaching you how unclear your instructions were. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Craig's got a good one. You know, Craig, Craig's been on the show a bunch. Craig Ware, for those of you out in the audience, and he, t- he tells his story at our, at our teacher training stuff. Um, all right, everybody put your hands up. And it was a new group and they literally just put their hands over their head. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Well, it's the same thing when I uh, have an instructor training program, you can get a black belt, but you can't be an instructor unless you've done mm-hmm. two years of, of teaching under my tutelage. Mm-hmm. I can give it a black belt, but some, some of my instructors are terrible with kids. I don't have to teach kids. They're great with adults. Some of my people are great with kids. They're terrible adults. Yeah. So, you know, but they need to know that. And I share that with them and saying, listen, you can get better. But for right now, your skill set is with adults and you do a wonderful job. Uh, so I did have one of my instructors one time. I left him with a kid's class because I couldn't teach that day. And he came back and he said, please don't leave me with the kids. They ran all over me. I go, what? He says, yeah, they ran all over me. They didn't listen or whatever. And I go, but you're the instructor. He goes, well, maybe you need to tell him that. <laughs> and he was an army veteran, but they ran all over him. Got to keep the energy up with the little ones. That's, oh, what, that's right. what I tell people. If you, if you want to teach kids, it almost doesn't matter what you do. If you convince them that you're excited about it, they'll follow you. And that's the thing. You have to have them have fun. Yeah. And you have to make sure it's fun for learning. Adults, they don't care whether you have fun. You know, they want to. You, you don't think so? I, th- I think they well, want to have fun. I, I think they just I don't do, admit it. I do seminars and I make sure all my. You, you're, I've been in your seminars. You have, you have a lot of fun. Yeah, we have a lot of fun. And in class, we laugh and whatever, but it's not the same with kids. You know, my kids want to run and do push-ups and jumping jacks and, and rolls and tumbling. I come to my adult class and say, okay, guys, we're gonna run, we're gonna roll, we're gonna tumbling. They're like, are you kidding me? <laughs> Cause I have an older group. Uh, all my young people are gone. This is my like third, fourth generation of, of people. They're, you know, kids I taught, Long time ago, they're running around the street with their kids going, hey, you know who that guy was? That was my sensei when I was a kid. And they're 45 years old. So, you know, my my group is changing. Yeah. I'm getting older people in who want to come and, 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 and get in shape, do some fitness, and, 
And now, when you say older, what, what ages are we talking about? We're talking 50 to 80. That's awesome. Yeah. What, what are you doing to make them comfortable? Because that's a that's an age group that most martial arts schools would love to have. What are you doing that well, the rest of us aren't? We break things down very slowly because okay. they're information based. They ask the questions. Why we're doing this block or why can't we do it this way? Or I feel uncomfortable doing this. And as long as you say, well, that's okay. I'm glad you feel uncomfortable. Because sometimes when we do things, you have to feel uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Because somebody grabbing you, you're not going to feel comfortable. That's not something that's happened to you. So we do a lot of training where we're teaching touch and grappling um, and having people talk about the feelings and how they do with the older group because it it's you can't just give a whole bunch of techniques they don't care about a whole bunch of techniques they want fewer techniques and understand what they're doing so we break it down very slowly very few techniques but techniques that they feel that they can do and that's the key not just giving a whole bunch of crazy techniques. Probably not a lot of jump spinning crescent kicks in no, your classes. We, we, we do four main kicks. Front kick, side kick, back kick, and maybe a roundhouse kick or crescent. And that's it. Mm -hmm. They don't need any more kicks. I agree. So we, we, we do five. My school has adds hook kick in there. You do the axe? No, hook kick. Oh, we do okay. round it round and hook. Yeah. If, if they they'll figure out an axe kick. Yeah. They'll figure out crescent kicks. I don't. I don't. I don't need to teach them that. My older crowd can't do a hook kick. <laughs> I bet they can if they do it low to the side. They they can. We have them kick the the pads low and, and hook, hook kicks are great for teaching sweeps. Yeah, yeah. That's the hardest thing for them. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's doing the sweeps, but, you know, we, we break it down in such a, a good way that they, they know they can do it. And also we do a lot of partner training. Mm -hmm. And the issue with partners is if you train today, your partner has to leave with the same information you left with. Mm. You can't just say, I can do the techniques, but they can't do it. I got to make sure that your partner is equal, right. so, you know. And if not, you're in trouble. <laughs> Here's a question for you, because we, we've talked about this arc of your time training and some of the philosophical differences o over the years. But let's, you know, let's let's really look at it as uh, a then to now. What do you if you could kind of go back to maybe not day one for you, but when you started teaching? If you could go back and, and visit that version of you when you were an early instructor, what would you be telling yourself to do differently? Teach less. I think in what way? The biggest mistake when you're a young instructor is you have a lot of information and you think it's important to just give all this information instead of standing back, give them very small sections because mm -hmm. it's hard even instructors now new instructors when they teach I see them make the same mistake they, they want to teach like the whole form the person and it's like no no only teach this amount but you want to show what you know so I think that was the thing I learned in the first year or so to cut back on I don't need to impress them that I know stuff because I know stuff. <laughs> but that's the feeling that you have. It's like, oh, I got to show them that I know all this stuff. Because you, you want them to believe that you're trying to help them. Yeah, I, yeah. It's, I think it, for most people, it comes from a good place. Yeah. But it can be yeah, so it, difficult. It, it does. But, you know, you can, you can get caught into that very easily of, of mm -hmm. overdoing it. And then you see the deer in the headlight where... Yeah. People just, they're, they're overloaded. And people need time and space to figure things out. I remember, and I remember this seminar so vividly. The instructor spent several minutes 
explaining and demonstrating what we were being asked to do. And I do it one time and it wasn't quite right. And he's right there <laughs> with another 30 to 60 seconds on what I'm doing wrong. And I'm just sitting there the whole time going, you know, the second one, pro thinking the second one probably would have been better. Right. Right. In this time that you've been lecturing me, how many more reps could I have gotten Absolutely. and gotten a little closer? We need space. We need time to make mistakes and figure things out. It's how, I mean, it's, it's how we learn everything. Somehow we don't seem to think some of us as instructors don't seem to think that that's the way we should learn. But well, and one of my instructors, Master Joe Salomone, when we trained silent training, you taught your technique. And you would practice that technique with your partner. One technique over and over, maybe 30 times, but no discussion. Would he critique or change anything or just observed? He would just observe. Mm -hmm. And then at the end, he'd call everybody out with your partner and you would have to demonstrate the technique. But all his classes were no talking hmm. because you learn from silence. Hmm. Too much talking in between means you're not practicing. You're not doing the technique. So all our classes for years were, were silent. Then at the end of a two hour class, you could talk with your partner. You could talk with the instructor about what you think, how well you did or whatever. So I learned a lot about Having people just go through and do techniques over and over again, you know. Um, and then a good critique is always being supportive. Mm -hmm. you know, what I teach my instructors is you say, let's, let's make that better. As opposed to, you're not doing it right. Uh, how can we make that better? That's a whole different positive way and kids are like, oh yeah, I can't wait to make it better. And adults, the same thing. But there's too much of that. You're not doing that right. That's wrong, whatever. Yeah. That negativity carries over into everything. It doesn't so help. Try anybody. to avoid that at all times. And that, and I think that's probably the the best lesson that uh, you know Shan Dwyer has learned because he everything he does is much more positive with all his his people and stuff. That's why he has a great school. You want to get better when he's teaching you. You just yeah. want to. He's inspiring in that way. Yeah. Not exactly. not because he's in the front of the room doing impossible things, but because you just feel it. And, and I think a lot of people in the audience have instructors like this. And if you don't, I hope you can find one where your instructor gets better. That they make you feel like you can get better. Yes. And they want you to get better. And they're willing to do whatever they can to help you get better. And I mean, who, who doesn't want to be in that environment? Who's not going to succeed in that environment? And, and, and that's, that's the biggest change in the martial arts, because in the old days, that wasn't the environment. Right. You know, the environment was military style, 8,000 push-ups and sitting on horse stands for an hour. <laughs> that was just pain. Stinking. Always more horse stands. Yeah. Uh, so I love the change in the martial arts over the years. Mm. You know, and I've been part of that change in terms of, you know, taking that traditional hard style of doing it and making it fun. Mm -hmm. People come to class if it's fun and enjoyable mm -hmm. and they're learning. And that's the key component to making the martial arts school successful with anything. Things can be difficult and fun. You know, how many martial arts schools out there would love to have the participation numbers of, you know, Spartan races? Oh, yeah. <laughs> right? That's yeah. really difficult and really fun. Yeah. Because they focus on on making sure you have the opportunity to have fun. And, well, it's funny important. because people who know me, you know, they think, oh, geez, he must have a big school. It's like, what? I've never had a big school because this is not my career. This is my second career. What is your career? Oh, I'm a mental health therapist. Oh. Yeah. I've well, that tracks. 45 years. The, the karate is just a way of, that's my fun time. Okay. <laughs> yeah. 
But, you know, so I meet a lot of people and they say, oh, geez, you know, how many schools you got? And I go, one, it's very small, whatever. And they go, what? I said, no, Jesse's got the big school. That's what I want him to have. He does that full time. He needs a big school. But for me, I've only done it part time mm -hmm. for the past 40 something years. Yeah. Maybe that's why my ego's not so large. Maybe. <laughs> what are you? What are you learning now? What are you investing your time into learning or improving or whatever word you want to throw there? Um, I'm learning my internal arts more. Okay. I do the Tai Chi, the Qi Gong, but I'm learning much more of the internal stuff. I've always had the external, been very good at it. Um, but I've been teaching Tai Chi now for probably 30 something years. And I'm getting better at it. And every time I do it, I understand it a little better. And uh, the breathing aspects are better, and the whole internal system is 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 better. Cool. And I think that's what people need to go to. Some systems, the Chinese system, start with the internal, go to external, and the rest of us start with the external, and hopefully at some point get to the internal step. We kind of what has backwards. how has that impacted your external? It's made it made it better. In what way? Um, movement mm. uh, and touch. I always tell people do three different things: I move, I touch, destroy, <laughs> <laughs> or we can say hit, but. I like destroy better. It's yeah. A better, it's a better word. Destroy. Move and touch, you know, and the movements are smaller. Mm. And when you first start doing karate, you do a lot of the large movements. But the, the more you go with the internal and the, and the system, is the more your structure lines and destroys their structure, it's very little movement that you have to do. The more exaggerated movements, the more you change your structure, not theirs. Mm -hmm. So that's what I've learned. And when I touch people, I always say, as soon as I touch you, I've changed your structure. I've heard you say that. But I'm not doing it in a hard way. Mm -hmm. You don't feel the change in your structure so dramatic, but it changes where I have the advantage. And so that's where the internal stuff does. Um, also, it just makes you feel better if you do the breathing exercises and qigong. Uh, you'll find out that your health is much better. Hmm. And as a trauma person, I do a lot of vets with PTSD, hmm. and the qigong breathing stuff helps for the PS post-traumatic stress stuff because before you can do cognitive behavioral therapy, I got to get that anxiety out of their organs before they can talk about it. So I've had a lot of success. So for me, that's that's the best benefit of that, is helping a lot of people with different uh, anxieties and, and different stuff, yeah. If people want to find you online, you mentioned website, I think you have social media too. You know, how, how would people get a hold of you? They can find me at uh, www.duncansmartialarts. They can go Rudy Duncan Facebook, they can go Duncan's Martial Arts Facebook. They're not hiding. They're, they're pretty they're easy. Not, they're not hiding. I can't hide. <laughs> <laughs> Even if I try to hide. Although I will say that uh, five years ago, somebody copied my whole webpage, changed just the words, and said they studied with me. Oh. And I visited the school. Oh. And call around. That go? <laughs> and and walked in and said, Oh, I'm the guy that you said you studied with me, but I never seen you. What happened? Well, I was very gracious. I I told him he was gonna do a seminar and I said, Oh, on Saturday the seminar you're gonna do, I'm gonna do. And you're gonna pay me. And that way I won't tell your parents that 
you've never studied with me. You don't know me. I said, you're a young kid. I'm, I'm glad that you feel like I was important enough for you to copy all my web pages and say you studied with me. But from now on, here's what you do. I know some people in Colorado. And what you're going to do is you're going to call them afterwards and you're going to train with them because they train with me. And then you can say that you did stuff with me. In the old days, it would have been bad stuff. But, you know, you, I, I'm trying to teach the kid a lesson because he was right. a young kid. And I said, listen, you know, at some point when you put stuff out there, people are going to check it out. And you're just lucky that I checked it out and then make a big deal and, and stuff like this because I want you to learn. You're not a bad kid. You just made bad choices. And lucky that your priority was still on education. Yes. Yeah. Right? Because you, you could have, I mean, you could have sued that kid into bankruptcy. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and what would be the purpose of that? Just, just you know, I mean, that's not my personality. My personality is that I saw that the kid wanted to do something. I, I felt kind of nice that he picked that he wanted to say he trained with me. Yeah. He just did it in all the wrong ways and, and, and stuff. Yeah. And I still hear from him. He's moved out to Colorado. He's got another school in another place. He's doing very well, but he keeps in touch with me. And so mm. that I feel is a great way of that story ending there. Yeah. I think that's a perfect illustration of who you are and why the people around you, because, you know, I, I heard about you for years before we met, but it is, it's why you're so special to so many people. Yeah. Somebody said, oh man, everybody gets along with you and everybody likes you. And I said, well, because I don't talk to the people who don't. <laughs> and they go, oh, I go, I don't know those people, so I don't talk to them. <laughs> Awesome. Well, uh, in a moment, I'm going to throw it back to you to close us up, but I'll, yeah. I'll do a brief outro here for the audience. So, hey, all of you out there, if you ever get the chance to train at a seminar with this man, or, or, or maybe, you know, you've thought, hey, I feel like going to Syracuse, take the opportunity because you're going to learn and you're going to have fun. And, and if you've been around long enough, you know those are the two check boxes that I think are important. Have fun, learn something. If you keep keep that on repeat, you'll you'll be great. Just yeah. you know, in a few decades. Yeah, and I just like to say I thank uh, Whistlekick and I thank Jeremy for allowing me this time. It was it was a pleasure. And once again, I'm Grandmaster Rudy Duncan, or just Rudy Duncan. And you're always welcome to come to Syracuse. I'll put you up if you want to train, or if you just want to pick up the phone and call me, and and talk with me. You're welcome to do that anytime. And and thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for being here. All right. Have a good one, sir.